Um, so we're really happy to have with us three leaders in public interest in Los Angeles. Um, and they all have a connection to Loyola, which I love. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them to first introduce themselves, tell us a little bit, not only about their agencies, but also about their career paths and how they got to where they are. And then we'll move into the issues about COVID and legal services and see sort of how we can do our best to help people during this difficult time. So I think we'll start with uh, Yvonne Maria Jimenez. So um, she is the CEO, president, executive director, or some title like that, of Neighborhood Legal Services. So Yvonne, you want to take it away? Thank you, Sandy. I'm in charge. That's how I look at it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for this invitation. This is one of the highlights of what I do uh, in my job. As Sandy said, I'm a graduate of Loyola Law School, and, uh, and I direct Neighborhood Legal Services of Valley County. Let me tell you that I went to law school to be a legal aid lawyer. Uh, this is the work that I wanted to do. This work is very personal to me. Uh, it's not a job, it's a vocation. I was born and raised in poverty. A uh, single uh, mom had a household who had a long history of institution institutionalization at LA County USC Psychiatric Hospital. And despite the fact that she had a long history uh, documented of that illness, it took her many years to qualify for social security disability. It wasn't until the Legal Aid Foundation of LA represented her and prevailed in her case that uh, it made a difference in our lives and that uh, memory is engraved uh, with me. Um, so the work that I do is very personal to me. I love it. Um, I'm gonna tell you a lot of things today and if there's anything you remember about today of what I said, two things. One, follow your passion in your legal career. Follow whatever's gonna get you out of bed every morning. I've been in legal services for 42 years. I still wake up every morning looking forward to doing the work that we do and to fight the good fight. And number two, even if you don't go and follow a career in public interest, think about pro bono service. Your talent, your uh, help can make a significant difference in working in collaboration with legal aid programs just as ours that you'll hear about today and make a difference in people's lives. So think about pro bono. Um, so that's what I wanted to make sure you, you remember. Neighborhood Legal Services is a, is a private nonprofit law firm. We receive funding from the federal government, state and local governments and private foundations to serve low-income individuals in those civil legal matters that most impact the poor, such as housing, access to public benefits, healthcare, immigration, workers' rights, housing, um, and, and so on. And uh, Neighborhood Legal Services has been around for over 55 years. Uh, it was established in 1965. We are today a program, uh, we have a budget this year of 22 million, we will have about 160 on staff, including 80 lawyers by the end of the year. Last year, we served 150,000 people. Uh, that includes about 7,000 individual cases. Now, you may think that Legal Services does a lot of direct delivery service work uh, representing individual people uh, in their family law cases, domestic violence, or housing cases, and that's true. We do do that. But we also do a lot of other uh, significant work that has a significant impact on the lives of thousands of people, not only in LA County, but the state of California. We do impact litigation. We file lawsuits that provide access to health care or good cause for eviction pu from public housing. So we do impact cases that will have an outcome for thousands of residents of LA County or the state. We also do policy advocacy. We have been at the table at the state and national level uh, during the foreclosure crisis in 2010. We were significant contributors to the California uh, Homeowner Bill of Rights. So we worked with the legislature on that. We worked at the federal le uh, level with Tom Miller, attorney general who filed a suit against the uh, five largest banks in collaboration with a number of attorney generals. So the work that we do is quite exciting and it's very impactful. Uh, in my career here, I also had the opportunity to do some international uh, work 
uh, looking at um, the domestic violence and violence against women in Ciudad Juarez uh, in a delegation with Mexico and um, the United States. So legal services as a whole does um, provide a world of work that one can do. And uh, it also includes work, transactional work. Right, and I'll talk about a few specialties. Cindy and I, our organizations cover some of the same areas. We're not gonna duplicate our information here today. I'm gonna to focus on three areas. We run a medical legal community partnership. Originally, the idea of lawyers and doctors working together to impact where people work, live, and play. Everything that affects them that provides a barrier to the something that they need, right? What we call the social determinants of health. Today, uh, we piloted that concept uh, 20 years ago, and we had our own medical legal community partnerships, MLCPs as we, as we uh, call them. And uh, two years ago, LA County Department of Health Services asked us to pilot that concept for the county, which we did. It was very successful. Today, the MLCP concept is embedded in the LA County health delivery system. It's the first in the country, and we're quite proud of that work. Uh, so we're doing a significant amount of work around patients who are referred to us from uh, county clinics and hospitals to impact housing, healthcare, and all those other areas that I indicated most impact the poor. COVID-19 hit in March. One of the issues that presented maybe fourth or fifth in line of all the work that we see catapulted to number one, unemployment. So many people lost their jobs. In March, over 4 million people applied for unemployment. Today, we've launched an unemployment uh, benefits clinic in collaboration with Loyola Law School. Very excited about that. To ensure that people have the help that they need to access those benefits. Uh, in particular, the, um, the communities most impacted right now are those that are non-English and non-Spanish speakers because the UI system has been provided in both those languages with instructions. But people who speak Chinese or Korean or Vietnamese are having a heck of a time trying to get through that system. So we've got those clinics going and that is one of the biggest uh, issues that presents today after uh, COVID-19 has hit and homeless um, prevention. We, as you know, uh, LA County, the state of California, the country is facing a homeless crisis. 25% uh, of all homeless people are in LA County. And so we have a collaboration of sister organizations, including Cindy's, my own and others, that have come together to form a consortium of organizations that are providing legal assistance, attorney representation, in order to keep low-income families and individuals housed. Uh, Gary Blasey, a former legal aid uh, lawyer, housing expert on homelessness, and UCLA law professor, has written an article recently that projects we will be seeing about 350,000 evictions in um, the coming months after the moratoriums lift and the emergency stay at home order lifts. So homeless prevention is one of those areas that we also uh, devote a great deal of um, attention to. And I'll stop there, Sandy. Okay, thanks Yvonne, that was great. Um, so since you mentioned Cindy and some of the things that public council is doing with you guys, I think we'll go to Cindy next. Um, so take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Cindy Panuco. I'm currently the Vice President and Chief Program Officer at Public Council, also um, a nonprofit legal aid organization in the city of LA. Our model is one of a pro bono model, so we are known as the um, nation's largest pro bono law firm. Um, we do match up our clients with uh, attorneys who can work with them on a pro bono, volunteers, um, law students interested in uh, getting some experience. Um, but how I, I ended up there, I've only been there uh, brand new to the position of a vice president. Um, and Yvonne mentioned she's the person in charge and I'm like the number two in charge um, at public council. I actually took over Li Elizabeth Bluestein's position, my, one of our <laughs> co-panelists, um, when she left public council, uh, left some big shoes to fill 
But prior to um, working at Public Council, which I've been doing now for just over a year, um, I was uh, a partner at a civil rights private um, non non not a private firm that dedicated its work to public interest cases. And so for 10 years, I litigated um, cutting edge civil rights, individual as well as class action and impact cases, partnering with organizations like the ACLU, like uh, public council, and um, working on some of the most you know, difficult, challenging issues that were being faced by um, communities of color, by low wage workers, by women. Um, so working on tackling all of those issues, along with one area, one large area of practice was um, civil rights and police reform cases that we took on, um, jail reform cases. We did a lot of individual police killings, individual jail conditions cases. Um, I litigated a um, large case involving a complete overhaul of the Orange County jail system. And one case that brought me to public counsel was having co-counseled a case on gang injunctions, um, which was a case challenging unconstitutional curfews and a law enforcement system a tool called gang injunctions that I won't get into in this um, segment, but long story short, it resulted in the end of the enforcement of a curfew provision um, that was affecting only black and brown members in communities of color. People who were, the only people who were served with gang injunctions were African American or black or, or Latino gangs. And uh, in, we ended up resulting in a $30 million settlement, which set up a jobs and education program that public council is now helping to monitor and administer for the last um, four years. And it was one of the first times where we were able to reimagine what the um, law enforcement, what a carceral system would be if we, instead of serving people with gang injunctions, connected them with counselors, connected them with jobs and education and benefit programs. And so that was um, one small taste of what we could be doing on a larger scale. Um, and so it was one of the driving forces for leaving private practice. I loved my work that I did at Hatzel Stormer in Pasadena. As I said, it's, it's a unique uh, private public interest law firm that there are a, a couple of other firms exist that do this work exclusively civil rights and plaintiff side work. Um, but it made me feel like I wanted to come to, to a place where I could continue to do the individual level work you know, irrespective of whether the, the, the work on the case was going to result in some sort of uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, result for the, to keep the lights on at the firm. I, I, um, that was something that we always had to be worrying about in the cases that we took, even though there was a lot of injustice, we couldn't take every case if it couldn't, if it didn't mean um, being able to, you know, bring some uh, funding in at the end of the day to keep our, our employees working. And so I think that was one of the biggest factors for me coming to public council. In addition to the opportunity to do um, policy advocacy, like Yvonne mentioned, um, public council is a place like NLS and some other legal services organizations where we are on the ground helping individuals with their everyday challenges, folks who fall into the debt trap. Um, Yvonne mentioned some of the areas that she's going to focus on um, at public council. We are helping um, folks with consumer issues that are resulting out of COVID-19, folks who need to um, renegotiate or deal with mortgage forbearance issues and get some of the benefits that um, that are being made available by some of the banks. We're also helping folks with some predatory um, lending practices under President Trump's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, consumers are the last people who are actually being protected and a lot of the financial industry um, is benefiting from deregulation. There's no one really watching how the financial industry is continuing to prey on folks even during this very difficult time, um, issuing them loans they cannot afford to pay. And they're mostly, it's mostly impacting, uh, again, communities of color, black and brown, who were already you know, hanging on the edge of a cliff financially and COVID-19 has, um, you know, has sent them barreling down um, a cliff. And so we're helping folks who are, um, you know, caught up in the, the debt trap. And we're, you know, in terms of immigrant rights, public councils always has been, you know, we have a immigrant rights practice. Um, uh, we have eight project areas, um, the immigrant rights, the consumer rights and economic justice project, children's rights, 
Um, we're, we're also working on homelessness prevention. We have a veterans rights project, a women and girls rights, um, and our impact litigation also. And so our work arises from the issues that we're seeing every day on the ground um, in our consumer work, in our children's rights work. We, because of that, when we start to see systemic problems, clients come to coming to us with the same issues over and over again, we're able to bring those stories to um, to the policymakers. And if policy changes are not being um, uh, heeded to the recommendations that we're making and the stories that we're telling, then we, you know, we take them to court, we sue them. We also use advocacy in the media. And so our um, Opportunity Under Law Impact Litigation Unit often handles a lot of the cases um, that end up resulting in some some sort of impact litigation strategy and our team has been on the front lines uh, as part of the lead counsel in the census case on the DACA case that was recently issued and they filed a um, the impact litigation unit along with our homelessness prevention and community development unit filed a case on behalf of tenants who whose claims and issues and um, stories should be heard in a lawsuit recently filed by the Apartments uh, Association, all of the um, landlords who want to challenge um, the city of LA's protections for tenants have sued to uh, to end those protections um, as unconstitutional against the city of LA. So we're suing on behalf of tenants. So I've ended up also like Yvonne doing this work because it is all very personal to me. I am a first generation daughter of Mexican immigrants. Um, I've had to help my mom through, you know, her own social security benefits was also um, raised in, you know, not complete poverty, but very low income household. I'm, you know, product of scholarships and grants and government sources. I've made it through college, you know, and law school through loans and all of the work um, that I've you know, dedicated my, my entire career from right after college going to work for then Congressman Javier Becerra, uh, representing one of the most impoverished congressional districts and diverse congressional districts um, in the nation. I've dedicated my entire, um, it doesn't feel like work when it's something that you're passionate about and you care about. And so I think working on racial, social, and economic justice issues has really been a driving force to me. And, you know, I never knew I'd end up at a, you know, one of the top civil rights law firms in the country. I never thought I'd end up at the nation's largest pro bono law firm as the number two. So in addition to the tips that, um, Yvonne mentioned to you, I understand there's a lot of students, um, and, um, recent grads on this Zoom webinar, um, one of the things I'd mentioned in addition to the tips that Yvonne shared is, you know, uh, I read a book recently and it, it hit home. It's be brave, not perfect. So, you know, I never thought with, you know, less than a year under my belt, I could qualify to, you know, try to fill Liz's position. But here I am, you know, 10 years out as the vice president of the nation's top pro bono law firm. So I feel really, you know, blessed. And I would really encourage folks to just, if you have a dream, go for it, chase it and and um, don't think that you're not good enough. Be brave. You never know. You'll end up, if you're chasing your passions and your life's work, then uh, things will work out. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, and, you know, both Cindy and Yvonne gave us a little bit of a foreshadowing of some of the issues we're going to talk about later on in terms of COVID and racial justice. But before we do that, we're going to hear from Liz Bluestein. So as Cindy mentioned, we were lucky enough at Loyola to steal uh, Professor Bluestein from public counsel um, to be the director of all of our clinics here at the law school. And since I think most of the people on the call are probably connected to Loyola in some way, um, you'll be very happy to know that she's not going anywhere um, because she's never leaving this job. Even though she left her last job, we're never letting her leave um, because she's amazing. And um, so I'm going to let her talk a little bit about not only how she, not only the clinics, but also how she got here. Thanks, Sandy. Um, thank you for the nice words. And um, yes, I, I joined the law school in January um, as the executive director of the Social Justice Law Clinic program, which is the umbrella organization for the school's approximately 20 um, live client clinics, um, which are both in-house and adjunct taught. And um, I, Sandy can rest assured because I came here after 15 years at public counsel. So I'm, you know, um, yes, I did leave there, but, but for a while. So um, working in um, the job Cindy has now and prior to that working in the community development project and representing community-based nonprofits. Um, like 
Yvonne and Cindy. I went to law school thinking that I wanted to be a public interest lawyer. And um, <laughs> of course, that led directly to me becoming a corporate tax lawyer at private law firms for 11 years. Um, so unlike them, it took me a little while um, to follow the path maybe less, less traveled at that time um, for law school graduates and find my way back to public interest in part due to um, spending my time at night coming back to Loyola Law School to take um, Professor April's tax exempt organizations class so that a corporate and tax lawyer could find their way into public interest. Um, so I guess my takeaway, the opposite of theirs, I do follow your dream. Don't forget about your dream. If you had it and now you're doing something else, you still can come back. And if you are a corporate or tax lawyer, um, as Yvonne mentioned, there are transactional pro bono opportunities and transactional ways to do public interest work as well. Um, and now I'm here and really um, excited and proud to be working with our amazing clinics um, that have been doing this work long before I got here. Um, so our, our major in-house staffed clinics include our Project for the Innocent, um, which dedicates itself to exonerating wrongfully convicted people and a system change to reduce future wrongful convictions. Um, and our Center for Juvenile Law and Policy, which includes a number of clinics, um, the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Youth Justice Education Clinic, holistically represent youth that are involved in the delinquency system, including foster youth, uh, both in criminal defense and education advocacy um, to support the youth um, today and in their future. Um, and on the other end of that spectrum, um, the Juvenile Innocence and Fair Sentencing Clinic, which represents people who were convicted as youth, who were wrongfully convicted or subject to unconstitutionally long prison sentences, such as life without opportunity to par for parole, um, to obtain their release from prison and, and exoneration, um, and our collateral consequences of conviction clinic, doing re-entry work um, and helping formerly incarcerated community members in navigating and overcoming collateral consequences of conviction to facilitate their successful reintegration um, into society after release. Um, and our Loyola Immigrant Justice Clinic, which advances the rights of indigent immigrant population in East Los Angeles um, through direct legal services, education, community empowerment, um, some of the same issues that um, Cindy mentioned, Public Council's Immigration Program works on, and a range of um, a range of immigration supports for our community. Uh, we also have our Center for Conflict Resolution, training students to provide mediation and conciliation services, serving communities throughout LA County, especially close to the law school, in matters um, such as family law, landlord tenant, consumer, debtor creditor, and other um, dispute resolution. Um, and we also have a numerous adjunct taught clinics um, in such areas as tax law, my um, my old favorite, um, landlord, tenant, employment rights, bankruptcy, appellate litigation, um, many more experiences for, for our students, um, including some in, pub, in partnership with our friends at public council and neighborhood legal services. Um, you know, now, um, obviously the way COVID-19 has affected all the communities we serve, um, you know, our work feels more urgent than ever and it also feels more urgent than ever to have students engaged in live client experience and to really think about the way that um, both the disaster and the ac economic recession following it um, really affect the clients that we serve and policies that have been put in place to address the pandemic and the economic recession, how they, um, how they affect our clients and um, how to get our clients' voices in to the decision-making in terms of what those policies and procedure changes are going to be. Hey, well, thanks so much for the three panelists. I wanted to let people know that in the chat, there are contact information for each of the panelists, as well as um, contact information for their programs is there. So should students want to volunteer and help with one of the clinics, um, I highly recommend that. So, Liz, you, uh, you started by mentioning the um, impact of COVID and making things feel more urgent today. 
And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about how your clients in particular have been impacted by the, by the pandemic. Sure. Um, and, you know, some um, probably obviously, I mean, we've been reading in the news that the, um, you know, the pandemic has become really rampant in prisons. Um, you know, our clients who are incarcerated, who are in prison, who are in juvenile detention situations, um, obviously anything that we can do to get them out of those detention situations uh, feels more urgent than ever. And we are working, you know, any way we can with emergency motions, clemency petitions, uh, preparation for parole hearings, any other avenues to get clients released. Um, our juvenile justice clinic similarly um, has seen it, the youth that are in detention, you know, juvenile detention is supposed to be rehabilitative. And due to the shutdown orders and some of the um, ways that they felt they needed to protect the youth who were inside were to stop outside service providers from coming in. So the rehabilitative services, education, even family visits um, have been curtailed or non-existent. And without the rehabilitative features of detention, with the added trauma of isolation from family, of isolation within cells in order to protect the youth because there's no other way to socially distance, um, you know, less, less ability to access the kind of distance learning that other youth um, have been asked to do right now. Our attorneys have been filing motions to reconsider the detention placement for every client. Um, you can, you know, you can seek reconsideration due to change circumstances, but up until now, that requires a hearing for every single client. And unlike some of the um, things that the governor or the prison system were able to do for e adults with a a small amount of time left on their sentence, the courts were taking the position that every client had to be considered individually. The courts seemed to be taking the position that COVID-19 alone was not enough of a changed circumstance. And in fact, sometimes that home would not be safer or more stable for the youth. So, um, you know, that's given rise to both a lot of individual casework and also a lot more, um, need for policy advocacy and for strategic litigation to try to, um, you know, to, to try to affect that, the whole system. Um, so our faculty, staff, and students have been involved in all three of those arms, um, you know, including filing a, a writ to try to get the Supreme Court to tell the Superior Court to consider youth in, in um, a more, um, sort of overarching way, but that, that has not happened yet. Um, but, but not even just in detention settings, everywhere, education um, and special education have been a real problem for some of our clients after schools switched to distance learning. Um, unequal access to technology and internet in some of our client communities meant disparate access to education. And then on top of that, youth with special education needs um, you know, the, the very first thing that schools had to jump in and do was to serve the larger, um, you know, group with kind of, I guess, average need to education needs. And so, you know, they just, things just weren't taken into account um, for the youth that we serve. And even still, um, school districts are not doing assessments for um, special education needs. And, you know, our education rights folks have continued advocating for services um, and conducting, you know, remote um, IEP meetings, et cetera, for youth that were already commenced, but how to appropriately advocate for clients when you can't get assessments done um, is another thing that's, that's affecting our clients. Um, and I'm sure Cindy can talk about immigration, but our, our community continues to, need our services more while being able to access them less. Um, I think another, um, you know, the, the technical divide has also affected those who used to walk in and get our services and who don't necessarily have um, the internet access, especially in a private and confidential setting to be able to um, access our, you know, our immigration or our reentry services that used to be um, done in walk-in settings in community. Um, organizations where the people would already be. Thank you, Liz. And I think you're exactly right that we're going to hear from everyone about the technology problems and the issues for people who don't have access.
Um, Cindy, do you want to talk a little bit about immigration and maybe something else that you've seen in terms of your clients and the impact of the pandemic? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the challenges that we've seen, obviously, is some of the uh, communities that we serve, particularly in the immigrant communities, are facing these same technological challenges. We've had to do workarounds, um, including, you know, this is very geeky, but using some, uh, you know, new uh, software that allows clients on their phones, we can send them some of the immigration forms we need them to sign. We can send them declarations to their phones, to tablets, because one thing that we have found is that folks at least have access to a smartphone or know someone who has a smartphone. <clears throat> but one of the challenges is a lot of things that we need, a lot of evidence that we need to gather from clients to put together these, um, these packets and to submit um, additional evidence that's requested by the government and their applications for immigration benefits. Um, they are, they require extensive information and evidence and we are having to do workarounds when folks used to be able to and are used to being able to come into our office. Our office has been closed to the public and to our clients, but um, they have been mailing in some of the documentation and evidence that we need to gather. Um, they have been also using this, you know, this software that we are able to send them forms to sign so they can electronically sign and send back to us court filings. Um, you know, for a while, the courts were still open and we were still having to do filings. Um, and that is, you know, still the case. A lot of immigration deadlines have continued to remain on calendar. Um, after the DACA decision, we saw a, you know, an influx of folks and an inquiry about what, what does this, what does the DACA decision mean for us? And um, one of the things that our immigration, immigration, immigrant, immigrant rights advocates have, um, have faced is this constantly changing world of, of, of policy changes, of new procedures, of, it's always like, what's next? And it's, we're just catching up with, you know, the latest, bad news that we've gotten about what um, what's happening in the world of immigration when there's, you know, another piece of bad news that we're having to to deal with. And so right now we're closely monitoring what it means, uh, what the DACA decision means and what the Trump administration is going to do um, in response. It looks like they're going to, you know, try to make another effort to rescind DACA in, in a way that follows what, um, you know, what the Supreme Court's, uh, direct, you know, at least what Robert's directive was about how my, maybe they could have gotten it right. So we're gearing up to continue to monitor that and take some immediate action um, based on what we're hearing on the ground and from our, our, our client population. But, you know, in terms of just generally also in addition to the immigration work that we do, a lot of our clients are immigrants um, generally, and they come to us with, um, with some issues related to not being able to access some of the stimulus money. And so we participated in this, um, this huge effort to try to get the word out about the funding that um, California and Governor Newsom made available to, um, to undocumented immigrants and family members who were not qualified or, you know, were disqualified by the federal government to receive stimulus funding. And we, um, along with CHIRLA and other nonprofit legal aid organizations, um, undertook efforts to reach out and help coordinate and, and get people connected to some of these, um, these funds. Because in addition to, you know, having immigration issues that we're helping them with, they have other financial issues. They also have, you know, debt that they need help with. They may also be considering um, declaring bankruptcy. Um, in the world of, you know, a public council, the, one of the areas that has seen the biggest spike in, in need at public council has been our consumer rights work and our bankruptcy work. I think we've been contacted, our, our, the contacts that we've received for assistance and consultation and assessment about whether they qualify or, or are proper to start considering bankruptcy, um, we've gotten inquiries that have increased, you know, 1,700 percent uh, by over a thousand percent our consumer line is getting 15 new calls every day with folks who have debt or mortgage issues um, and again it's all all related to the the unfortunate downward spiral of, of um, you know being involved in poverty and the debt trap and um, so those are some of the areas that I think um, you know as the courts reopen, where our homelessness prevention project, probably as well as NLS, are preparing for a flood of, of evictions that are going to be filed by landlords when the moratoria are lifted. And there's potential discussions about whether some of the um, back rent can be converted into consumer debt. And, you know, it might be just transferring, you know, eviction proceedings to 
debt court proceedings, no matter what, there's probably going to be actions by these landlords to either, you know, get folks out of their homes if they can't pay rent or if the rent is turned into some sort of consumer debt, there's going to be actions and, you know, in debt court to collect. And so I think um, this all plays into some of the larger issues that we should all be aware of um, that the, you know, the state bar is taking actions to possibly allow non-attorneys to provide some limited legal services to people. Um, and, and, you know, in our opinion, at least at public council, we've been working on the notario fraud issue. We, we've seen what happens when we allow non-attorneys to prey on immigrant communities, to tell them they can do work for them and just take their money and ruin their immigration cases. They want to expand that ability to allow folks to, you know, to help with housing issues, to help with veterans issues, to help with, you know, general benefits issues. And I think, you know, something for us to, to be aware of is that basically it's lowering the quality of legal services that we're offering to the poor. We're not saying let's match them up with lawyers, let's give them the right to counsel in, you know, in civil proceedings. We're saying let's just, you know, give them low quality, basically, you know, untrained legal assistance um, to try to address the justice gap. But it's something that we should, you know, all care about. And as, as Yvonne mentioned, always have pro bono and the folks that that are having to proceed in, you know, some of these uh, court spaces without the assistance of an attorney it should be always in the back of our mind um, if we have time to, to dedicate to, to doing some pro bono work. Absolutely. And, you know, this is a, this, the state bar is struggling at the moment, not only with this, but what to do about a bar exam. And I know a number of our students are struggling with figuring out what they're going to do. So Yvonne, tell us about your clients. How has COVID affected them? Well, I think as we've heard from Elizabeth and Cindy, that uh, low income individuals and communities are always the hardest hit when disaster strikes. COVID-19 has been no exception. And so people living on the margins were struggling before this disaster. Now their needs have been exacerbated, access to food, shelter, health care, um, you know, employment benefits, public benefits, since many have lost their jobs, information, Information is power, and getting education and information out to community is really important. Neighborhood Legal Services is also uh, an expert and has long time been a leader in disaster legal services. Dating back to the 94 earthquake and to Katrina in Louisiana, we've been doing disaster work. And it is because of that that we were able to ramp up quickly and get everybody at 100% remote operations within two weeks after the shutdown. Since then, I'll tell you that one of the greatest challenges has been people accessing our organizations because our offices are closed. So, and as we've heard, we've leveraged a lot of technology to uh, present, do workshops, we're on every social platform. That said, there is still a core of low income uh, residents of Valley County who have no access to technology. So we've been very attentive to that of how do we get it out? How do we collaborate with elected leaders, decision makers in order for information to get out to community? There are a lot of uh, protection measures that have gone into place since COVID-19 hit. Um, you know, the uh, housing, uh, homeless prevention, uh, the upcoming eviction defense program is key. But the fact is that unless people have access to an attorney to access those benefits, those protections and benefits are meaningless. So this is where our law students come into play, pro bono lawyers come into play, to, to collaborate with our public interest organizations to leverage and to be able to deliver more services um, to those very communities that need it the most. So COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the work that we do and the clients that we serve. And one other one, we're going back, the courts have reopened, but the court is looking to all the technology, right? Court calls, connect, you know, all of the technology to have hearings. In fact, all the tribunals are. We're very attentive to what happens to those individuals who have no lawyers, are self-represented, and don't have the information or the access to this technology. So another challenge. Yeah, thank you. And obviously, this is a big challenge for all of us. I don't want to leave today without talking about the other challenge that we face and the other thing that we're seeing happening today, which is the fight for racial justice. And, you know, this has come up um, recently, but of course, it's been an issue for ever. 
Um, and I wondered if you would like to add a little bit about what lawyers can do, what you're, you know, what can legal services do to help in this fight, and how can we be, I guess the, the only word is helpful. So Yvonne, we'll let you go first this time, since she had to go last last time. Yeah, one thing that COVID-19 did is that it put on the public stage the racial inequities that exist in all of these services that public interest lawyers have known forever, right? But now it's on the public stage. We have an opportunity. Um, we are looking at our organization, at the work that we're doing. We've decided that we're going to focus geographically. So we're focused in the Yellow Valley where there have been challenges that we, lawsuits we brought against cities up there that discriminate uh, predominant, prim primarily against black families and individuals. The Department of Justice was brought in. They're there now. There's a consent decree enforcing uh, the elimination of pernicious practices by the Sheriff's Department. Our organization has expanded our staffing there. We have opened up uh, clerkships, internships for law students to help with that work. And so we have dedicated funding for um, that area to look at the racial, um, the race-based challenges that exist there that we have been involved in for a long time. Thank you. Cindy, what about public counsel? Hi, yeah, so at public counsel, we're also having to, um, some of the work that's having to happen is both internal and external. So internally, we're having to look at our own hiring and um, retention and recruitment practices. What are we doing to make sure that we have a racially diverse staff and a um, programming that is geared towards identifying areas where we should be doing uh, more work in racial justice. We have identified, we've already been working on um, dismantling uh, school police. And so we've been really involved in the campaign on um, defund LAUSD, which resulted in um, at least a cut to the budget and a commitment to, to study the issue um, of how the school to prison pipeline is per, you know, perpetuated by um, the continuing um, presence of law enforcement on, on school campuses. And so we're redoubling our, our efforts there. We're also looking at um, some of the larger systemic issues that um, in the areas that we've been working on, like, um, like banking. Um, for, you know, communities of color have been robbed of opportunities and generational wealth by some of these big banks who weren't lending to them because of their alleged, you know, uh, credit history, lack of credit history, where they lived, a lot of um, engagement in redlining. Um, it's also banks are, um, you know, guilty of some of the other um, things that we're seeing now, which include predatory lending. So if they were first denying people loans based on the color of their skin, they're now also preying on people, giving them loans that they can't afford, putting them into the debt trap. Um, taking their homes. And so those are some of the issues that, again, only affect black and brown communities. And we're also working on some of our, um, the areas of um, criminal justice reform and the um, private entities that profit from the ma from mass incarceration and the over policing of people of color. So in our consumer space, we're looking at taking on the bail industry, and that's something that we're we're doing. Um, we're you know piece by piece trying to um, you know nip at the various institutional actors that are contributing to the, um, the mass incarceration and, and over-policing of communities of color. And so in addition to doing, you know, some of the internal work to make sure that our, um, our organization reflects the communities that we're serving, we're also we're making sure we're continuing to focus um, and, and, you know, do a lot of work in the areas that um, most impact the, the communities of color. And there's definitely opportunities for folks to um, volunteer with us. If you are a retired attorney, if you are a student, if you are a recent grad, um, one of the links that was shared by Maya in the chat, um, it pro will provide, you know, different areas where you are, that you can volunteer in if you're interested in getting involved in some of the work that our um, projects are doing either in, um, you know, the defund LA school police or um, some of the consumer rights issues um, and our impact litigation could always use some research and support. Thank you. And Liz, what about the Loyola clinics? 
Sure. I mean, similar to everyone else, you know, in addition to looking at our own internal operations um, and external work, you know, we're also thinking about how to educate students, um, you know, how our work with students ought to emphasize what are the underlying structural issues and what is the underlying, you know, some of the underlying um, racist systems and inequality that have led to um, some of the policies, procedures, and laws that we are working within today. Um, you know, just like with um, the different impact that um, COVID-19 has had, and as Cindy mentioned, the over-policing and the, you know, the disparate treatment in schools um, and how um, much black and brown communities are affected by, um, by the police systems, by the school to prison pipeline, you know, who is in prison? Um, why is it so easy for um, decision makers and people outside to, you know, forget about or not pay attention to what is happening in black communities or inside um, carceral settings where um, there's a disproportionate number of people of color. Um, and so I think part of it is expanding our work around the system change work. Um, we are also participating in some of the education rights and um, school to prison pipeline work and our education uh, clinic is going to also be starting a policy practicum in the spring to um, further look at some of these underlying issues and how we can work with um, coalition partners to, um, to address them. Um, you know, working with students um, to think about um, how we can engage in strategic litigation um, and also how we can engage in policy advocacy to, um, to get the voices of our clients to be heard by decision makers as they are making decisions and as they adjust rules. So that things that are done in the name of public safety, whether it be in policing or whether it be in the name of public health now, aren't going to disproportionately affect um, communities of color. Um, Cindy had mentioned at the beginning, um, one of the exciting cases she worked on in, in regards to gang injunction, um, changing the narrative within the criminal justice system about communities of color and about who lives there and about what the youth are doing. And we've been um, excited to just get some funding to start um, a gang expert college you know, when, when youth, um, especially, but when people are um, uh, being convicted of a, of a crime, if the prosecutor can share, uh, show gang involvement, they might have an enhanced sentence. And this is leading to longer sentences to people who are, um, you know, stereotypically, you know, assumed to be involved in gangs and getting folks other than police trained to be experts um, to, talk about what the social science really shows about youth, um, making sure that the special ed assessments we mentioned are still going forward. So any of those systemic, that systemic work that we can look at that maybe um, some other actors, whether it be the private firms that um, can't do work that won't result in, in fees or the public defenders who are part of the county and, you know, can't sue the government. Um, what role can we play as, private actors who are working with clients affected by these same things. Thank you all so much. This has been really enlightening, inspiring. I know that we were supposed to end a few minutes ago, and so, but we're still going. And I do think that I can get the panelists to stay on for another minute or two. If there are questions, people can put it in the chat. Um, I know many of the attendees have to go back after their lunch breaks and go back to work. So um, I'm gonna, we'll wait a minute or so and see if we get any questions. If not, we'll wrap it up. But I wanted to mention that one of the things that Loyola is trying to do is to also do the same thing that these organizations talked about, which is to look internally and see if there are ways that we inside ourselves can be more careful and more conscious of race-based discrimination. And um, as you all know, Loyola does have a pro bono graduation requirement that requires all of our students to do at least 40 hours um, in pro bono or prior to graduation. And so the opportunity for students to do that with 
one of these organizations or with our own clinics is there. And we hope that many of you will, if you haven't already done that, work with one of the organizations. Well, I think that's all. Then thank you all very much. We could give a round of applause, except we can't, but I will <laughs> give a clap to our panelists and thank them so much for joining us. Uh, Maya, is there anything else we need to do before we wrap? No, nope, we're all good. Okay, thank you all for attending. Um, I hope you will contact folks based on the chat um, information and feel free to contact me anytime at the law school. Take care and have a great rest thank of the you. week. Bye. Thank you.